King Faisal Foundation is the oldest foundation in the kingdom, and it have devoted its uh, activity towards education and research. So they have King Faisal School, they have uh, King Faisal Al Faisal University, they have uh, the Islamic Studies and Research Center scholarship program, and also they have the King Faisal International Prize. King Faisal International Prize is now 35 years old and it gives prizes in medicine in addition to science and Arabic and Islamic studies and uh, a prize for serving Islamic uh, duties. Uh, over the last 35 years, King Faisal International Prize have positioned itself as the second after Nobel Prize, both in value and in rank. Actually, seven of the King Faisal International Prize winners after taking that prize, they ended up by taking Nobel Prize. So that's a good indication of its importance, its vigorous uh, selection criteria and review. And really, we are honored with all winners of King Faisal International Prize. Uh, today, on behalf of King Faisal Specialist Hospital and its research center, uh, one of the leading hospitals in the Middle East and research center is one of the actually uh, state-of-art research center worldwide headed by uh, His Excellency uh, Dr. Sultan Sideri, the uh, executive director of the research center and also Al Faisal University, one of the King Faisal Foundation uh, actually projects uh, that have a very strong, well-positioned uh, College of Medicine are happy actually to uh, host this lecture and uh, introduce the two uh, winners for this year to give us their uh, input and the research, latest research in their field so that we can uh, experience that. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure first to introduce Professor Joris Voltman. Uh, Professor uh, Voltman is a graduate of uh, medical school and then followed by uh, genetic uh, research. He uh, currently had his PhD in uh, 1999 in molecular cell biology and then followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in San Francisco in USA until he was appointed back in uh, Radboud University uh, as an assistant professor from 2005. Uh, now he is currently a full professor in human genetics and he uh, actually the head of genome research division. Uh, working at uh, Maastricht University. I want to just highlight uh, Maastricht University for those who don't know. This is one of the leading medical schools in Europe. They are the first uh, in the world that apply the problem-based learning and block system. We actually at Al Faisal University and at different universities in, king in the kingdom have a strong collaboration with Maastricht University as one of the leading uh, schools in College of Medicine. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Professor Jaris to give us his talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here and thank you for the invitation, uh, Dean. and. Uh, faculty here. It's a big pleasure to be here and to present our work and of course we are honored to receive the King Faisal International Prize which is uh, really uh, an amazing honor. So I will uh, start my talk by discussing with you the progress that we made more in the field of the technology um, of, of, of genetics and I will explain how we apply this in our research and then uh, my colleague Professor Brunner will talk more about the clinical impact of this work. So I will start briefly with some of the challenges that we face in medical genetics. I will talk about the technology that we use, whereby we can go from sequencing individual genes to sequencing the entire DNA of an individual. I'll, I'll illustrate how we can use this in our research to study the causes of disorders like intellectual disability, and I'll uh, put a lot of effort on explaining to you the role of de novo mutations in, in, in disease. And finally, I will end with just a little bit looking forward to think where we can actually move our field further because there are so many more applications where genomics can make an impact in medicine. 
So clearly it starts with the patient in our field and there's many questions that are encountered in medical genetics when parents uh, have a child which is not developing well, they want to know what's happening in their child, uh, they want to know what's the cause, they sometimes feel uh, uh, that, that they are perhaps guilty, something happened during the pregnancy, they want to know whether it can, something can be done about it and of course they also want to know if I get a second child what's the chance that I get another child with a severe disorder. So they want to learn a lot of this. And for many of these orders, we actually, uh, oh, let me, can I go back here? Mm -hmm. I'm a bit careful. Sorry. It is? Okay. okay, thank you. All right. So for finding uh, the genetic cause of these diseases, of course, we have to look at the DNA, at the genome. And our genome is very, very large. It consists of six billion nucleotides. Uh, and we have to study all of these. And we know also that people vary a lot at about four million positions if you compare the genomes of two individuals. At the same time, these individuals are mostly healthy and they vary already at four million positions, but we know that just a single nucleotide change can cause a severe disorder. So it's a very big challenge in that area. And um, this was really difficult in, uh, just a, a few uh, decades ago because we had technologies who did not allow us to look at everything. Uh, we had technologies like Sanger sequencing, whereby we could sequence individual genes. So we needed a, a clinician to help us, to guide us to the right gene to be tested. And then we had the, the microscope where we could do chromosome studies, whereby we can look at the entire DNA, but we can look with a very low resolution. Later on, we replaced this with the genomic microarrays, and we've been involved very much in using genomic microarrays to replace karyotyping. And this was very good because you could detect smaller deletions and duplications in the genome, but still you could not detect the, the real, the most small variations in single nucleotide mutations. Now, a lot has happened in the last 10 years, uh, and we have technology now which is called next generation sequencing which is a bit strange because, of course, we already use it now. And it's really because of miniaturization and parallelization that we're now able to not sequence just a few DNA fragments at a time, but actually to sequence millions of fragments at the same time. And that has a very big impact on our field because it allows us to go from an area where we actually needed an expert to say, okay, let's look at this gene or look at that gene, now to look at all genes at the same time or even look at the entire genome. And that is something that is really changing our area because it is really allowing us to look at the entire genome for the first time. There's lots of companies involved, there's big competition in the field, and this is fantastic because that is driving the prices up and it's raising the quality of reading the DNA. Because you have to realize that when you sequence the DNA, if it's very large, like a human genome, you have to have a very good measurement of the DNA, because else you will actually look at lots of mistakes, uh, whereas, you know, that's not what you want if you would like to look at the individual causes of disease. So, where we're now moving to is an area where we can look at the entire genome. And that is allowing us to look at all variation in just a single experiment. And that is, of course, very, very important in our research and in our clinical care. Clearly, as I mentioned, it's very important that the genome has to be measured very accurate and very fast because we want to do clinical diagnosis in days instead of in years or in months. And it has to be affordable. And nowadays, uh, this is becoming a reality. The nice thing of genome sequencing is that you can actually have a single test for all disorders. So it doesn't matter what your patient has, whether he has intellectual disability or whether he has cancer, you can look uh, with the same test at the genome of this individual. So that makes it in the laboratory very easy because you have a single test. Uh, so you can do with every patient the same test and you can then look at all the variation and try to interpret this. And clearly, this will be different for intellectual disability, where there is often just a single mutation that causes disease, whereas in cancer you see that it's a very big genomic instability because of the cancer process. So this figure is, is very important in our area. It is a figure that we use a lot, where we show that the price of sequencing a genome is dropping dramatically. And this is really something that's happened just since the beginning of this millennium, whereby sequencing a genome was still a few hundred million euros, and now we can sequence genomes for about a thousand or two thousand euros, which is, of course, uh, something that makes uh, the technology affordable in our clinical settings, which is great. And with that, I think our, our field is moving from an industry, from, from an art, I'm sorry, from an art whereby people had to be good at recognizing chromosomes, and it's really moving to an, oops, I have to go back again, to an industry whereby we 
do the genetic test in an industry, industry scale, putting in the DNA of large numbers of patients at the same time, and then reading out the DNA in our computers and trying to interpret it and link the genetic variation to disease. So just one thought that sometimes people ask me, why would you uh, perform genome sequencing? You can also do other kind of sequencing, uh, testing a few genes, for example. And I think perhaps in, in, in 10 or 20 years, we will look back at that and we think that this is a very strange question. We will say, well, this is about like asking the question, why not read an entire book, right? If you think about a genetic disorder, you want to look at the entire DNA and try to interpret this. We have to be very careful that we think already we know a lot about genetics because we really still live, I think, in the dark ages of genetics. It may be that you see a certain mutation in one gene and you think this is the cause in your patient, but actually when you look at the genome, you'll find that there is a big deletion somewhere else on another chromosome that is actually the cause of the disorder. So I think that is something that we have to all realize that we're still at the start of our field. And of course, there's key advantages of the technology. It's complete, huh? so you have all variation, all different types of variation in the DNA from the point mutation to the chromosome abnormality, and you have it in a single test. So it's also simple. That's very important. Because of this reason, uh, genome sequencing centers are set, set up around the world. So this is becoming very big. And I know also here in Saudi Arabia, genome sequencing is uh, being set up in large scale uh, centers. And this is very important. Not only the, the sequencing, but also the, the bioinformatics, the, inter the interpretation is very important to, to put forward. In, in England, they're sequencing hundreds of thousands of genomes. In China, up to millions already. So this is becoming something that is not longer for very few patients. It's becoming a, a routine care in our clinic. And this means that a lot of the work is, is actually moving from, let's say, the bench, huh, to the, the people doing the laboratory work, to actually the people doing the, the interpretation. And bioinformaticians are crucial in this field, and, uh, and, and really high-capacity uh, uh, high computing is important. And we have to invest both in learning people to work with uh, genetic data, to, uh, as well as, uh, as handling this and, and putting this forward again in a clinical practice. So with this, as an introduction, I think we have to be honest and say that we are at the new start of, uh, of genetics again. It's really fascinating to work in our field where technology is changing us and it's changing the way we do business, it's changing the way we are diagnosing patients. And let's now apply this to a disorder. So we've been working a lot on the genetics of intellectual disability. And genetic intellectual, uh, intellectual disability has been a little bit of a, of a paradox because as you know, uh, intellectual disability is an early onset disorder, and when it's severe, it actually has a big impact on fitness. So that means that if you have intellectual disability yourself, you will not likely get children. Uh, uh, so that actually is reducing your fitness. At the same time, we know that intellectual disability is occurring very frequently in our population, in the Netherlands, in about 1 to 2 percent of the population. And we know that intellectual disability is a high genetic component. So you see that in most cases, healthy parents get a child with intellectual disability. And people have been wondering, um, why are disorders which are with a reduced fitness uh, still so frequently present in our population? You would imagine that they would actually be selected out. And one of the explanations for this, um, so this is actually, uh, sorry, this is actually not only happening for, for intellectual disability, it's also happening for many rare syndromes and also for the severe forms of autism and schizophrenia. Uh, so you see often a sporadic case, just a single patient in our family, and especially in the, in, in the outbred populations you see this happening. In, in the Netherlands we've looked at this in Nijmegen, 92% of our patients with severe intellectual disability, they occur sporadic, so you just have a single patient in your family. One of the explanations that you can think of while this is explaining why these disorders still occur in our population is actually that there is new mutations being uh, coming into the population. So you have a selection against the disorder once you have it, but there is new mutations uh, giving rise to new uh, patients in every generation uh, into the population. And what's happening is you have to imagine it's just very simple. You have, uh, of course, your DNA is being copied with every cell division, and when your sperm cells and oocytes are being made, uh, this happening is also, and what you could happen is you could have copying mistakes whereby uh, mutations are introduced into the sperm cell, which then can give rise uh, to the next generation and thereby introduce new mutations in the DNA. So this is something that we are very interested in studying, uh, and we know the, the role of, of de novo mutations in disease very much. 
The Down syndrome with the trisomy 21 is explained by de novo mutations. It's a de novo chromosome uh, 21. But also for very rare syndromes, we know that they are often explained by just a new mutation of a single nucleotide. So we know that these mutations, these de novo mutations, occur in rare disorders, and we know that they occur at all different levels of the genome, from the point mutation to the entire chromosome. So this is something to realize, but so far we had difficulty studying these. And now, because of the technology, we can for the first time look at the role of de novo mutations uh, in the entire genome. So what we actually do here is we sequence not only the genome or the, or the exome of the patient, but also the genome of the parents. Uh, who are healthy themselves. And then in the computer we can actually look at the variation, we can see what is inherited from either the father or the mother, but also we can identify the new mutations that come into the uh, patient and that may explain the disease in the patient. So that is very important, the combination of, of sequencing an entire genome, but then also not doing this only in your patient, but also doing it in the parents. So we started with this in, in 2010, and we started not with genome sequencing, which at that moment was still too expensive, so we started with, a, let's say, a, an alternative, which is called exome sequencing. It's a technology whereby you sequence all the genes in the genome, but not uh, the parts outside of the genes. So this is about 1% of the genome, so it's a little bit less, but it's still important because those are all the functional parts that we know of. So we started to sequence exomes uh, in these patients and also in their parents. In the beginning, we did this for very rare syndromes, whereby we don't know so much yet about the genetic causes, and we have only selected a few patients. So, and the approach we took is we would sequence the exome of a few patients with the same phenotype, so the same syndrome, and we would look then for uh, uh, severe deleterious mutations in these patients, follow these up in the parents, and then follow up additional uh, patients. And what we identified is that for many of these unexplained syndromes, exome sequencing allowed us to identify de novo mutations in genes explaining these rare syndromes. So this was very uh, good for all these patients with these rare syndromes, and this was not only done by us, but by many groups around the world, and it's still happening, and this is allowing us to explain the rare diseases in many uh, of these uh, patients, which is great, uh, because they really need help and we can now diagnose them rapidly if we can find their genes. So here you see how many genes are now being discovered uh, because of the, the use of exome sequencing and genome sequencing. This is important in the clinic, but of course also from a biological point of view to learn about these genes and their function and what we can do about them. So we wanted to take this further, we were wondering whether de novo mutations were only important in rare disease, but also perhaps important in common disorders. Uh, and we knew from the first studies done in, in genome sequencing of, of uh, parents and their offspring that an average person has about something like 50 to 100 new mutations in their genome. So every one of us will have something like 50 to 100 new mutations in your genome. And that means that you have something like one to two of these mutations in the coding region. So one to two genes that you have will have a new mutation. So we were wondering whether these could cause also more common disorders. And for that you have to uh, think about the mutational target. So it's actually shown here below. So what you see here is that for a very rare syndrome, CHARGE syndrome, we see that all the patients are explained by mutations in the CHD7 gene. So there's de novo mutations in this gene that explain that disorder. Well, fortunately, this is just a very small gene, this is just one gene, and because you just have one or two mutations in, in a gene, in total in your, in your genome, it means that the chance that you have a mutation in this gene is actually very uh, low, and that is fortunate because it means that this disorder will always remain uh, very rare in the population, occurring in about one to 10,000 patients. However, if you think about a disorder like intellectual disability or autism, we know that there is actually probably more than a thousand genes that when just one of these genes is mutated, you can already uh, get intellectual disability. So that means that the mutational target is much bigger and you have a higher chance that one of these mutations can cause disease. So this is what we wanted to test. Uh, and we did exome sequencing in patients, but also in parents of, uh, of patients with intellectual disability. And we were looking for these kind of mutations here, whereby you see a zoom in of a next generation sequencing result. You see that everything in gray in this area is actually comparable to the normal uh, genome. Uh, but here you see that there is a C instead of an, an A here. And you see that in the parents, this C is not present. So this means that there is a new mutation in, occurring in the patient and it's occurring in the gene that actually is giving rise to intellectual disability. 
So we started in 2010 with the first 10 patients, and we identified already a few de novo mutations in genes that we could link to intellectual disability, but also we found many mutations that in, in genes that were not yet known to cause intellectual disability. We confirmed this in a larger study in 2012 with 100 patients, and at that time we actually already implemented exome sequencing in our diagnostic setting, and we could diagnose in the first study 16% of the patients with a de novo mutation. So we concluded that trio-based sequencing uh, of the exome is very important for detecting these de novo mutations, and these de novo mutations appear to be a major cause of intellectual disability. And we also saw that exome sequencing is a good diagnostic test, so we implemented this in our diagnostics. Now we had very many new genes, and of course that is very important in our area. We realized that we know not so much about the genetics of intellectual disability, so we had to sequence many more patients in order to find a second or third patient with a mutation in the same gene. And we used very different approaches for this, and one of the most important actually turned out to be so-called targeted next generation sequencing, whereby you take something like 50 to 100 new candidate genes, and you sequence them in 10,000 patients or so, and then you can find a second or third or a fourth patient with a mutation in the same gene, and then you can go to the clinic, you characterize these patients, you do functional studies to learn about the impact of the mutation, and thereby you can characterize and determine a new gene for intellectual disability. So this is something we do in, in great collaboration with groups around the world, including groups here in Saudi Arabia. And this is very important for our field because this is a graph showing you that the number of genes that we can now confidently link to intellectual disability is already more than 700, and it's really sharply rising because of all the new discoveries that we are making together. And that means that, that also the approaches that we use in order to diagnose these patients have to take this into account. So for intellectual disability, exome sequencing or genome sequencing is, is really preferred because you can actually update your analysis. But if you would make a targeted uh, test, you would have to update it every year almost to include new genes that are being discovered so rapidly in your clinic. Now, I just want to briefly talk a little bit about the move from exome sequencing to genome sequencing. In 2014, uh, we published the first study about this, whereby we sequenced patients who were negative after exome sequencing, and we, uh, was, uh, we sent the DNA of these patients, again, together with their parents, to a company called Complete Genomics, and they did the genome sequencing for us, and we looked at, the, at many of the things that we could detect in that. And one of the few examples that I want to show are interesting just to highlight the power of genome sequencing in the coming period. So one example I wanted to show is a patient uh, where, uh, which was seen in our clinic and the patient fits with the red syndrome spectrum uh, and for this spectrum, uh, actually, the, the gene MEGI2 is the, uh, is the likely causative gene. So our clinical geneticist had indicated that this gene should be tested, and it was tested by Sanger sequencing, and it turned out to be negative. But the clinician was very, let's say, he was a very strong believer that this was, must be the truth, so we did an additional test, it's called MLPA, it's a quantitative test, and again, it turned out to be negative for, for deletions in this gene. But finally, we did genome sequencing, and we found out that, indeed, the clinician was right. There was a deletion in the MACP2 gene, which was missed by Sanger sequencing and by the MLPA test. And it turned out that this is the explanation. So the deletion takes out the primers which are used for Sanger sequencing. So you can only sequence the wild type. And the probe which was used for looking at deletions was located outside of the deletion. So I think this is a very good take-home message that many people think that genome sequencing is important for, for looking at patients when you don't know what their probable cause is, but actually in this case the clinician knew already that it's likely to be in this gene, uh, and actually it turned out that genome sequencing was the best test to detect this. Another very nice example that we identified in our first cohort of 50 patients was a duplication on chromosome 4. A duplication was missed by the standard microarray technologies that we used at that moment. Um, but if we would have seen it with the microarray technology, we would have said, well, there is a duplication there. We would have looked at the genes in that genomic region, and we would have said, well, these genes do not explain the intellectual disability in our patient. And that's indeed correct, because these genes in this region do not explain the intellectual disability. But what we did is we looked further at the data, and it turned out that this duplicated sequence no longer was present on chromosome 4, but it was actually uh, integrated on chromosome X. And we looked at the data of our genome sequencing study. It turned out that on chromosome X, this new uh, duplicated sequence was uh, integrated into a gene and it disrupted the reading frame of a gene on chromosome X called IQSEC2, here this gene, 
And the name of this already gives it away. It's called IQ. And indeed, this is a known intellectual disability gene. So what you have here is a duplication on chromosome 4, giving rise to disease on chromosome X by disrupting a gene uh, located on this chromosome. And that's clearly an example where genome sequencing can only give you the answer. That's not something you can see by SAR sequencing or microarray studies. So for this very small first study, we determined the, the diagnostic yield. Uh, and of course, we knew that many tests were already done. And one of the things we wanted to know is what would be the diagnostic yield if we would have done genome sequencing as a first tier test. And that's shown here at the bottom. You'll see that in our diagnostic, in our cohort in Nijmegen, we expect that we can now diagnose 62% of all patients with unexplained intellectual disability uh, with an IQ below 50. And you see that in our cohort, most of these are caused by de novo point mutations. And then we have de novo copy number variations. And we have only a very small part where there is recessive inheritance. Also, you see that there is still a very large part which is unexplained. And that is because there may be many things, like, for example, non-coding mutations, that so far we have not been able to interpret in our clinic. So we still have a long way to go. The good thing, however, if you look at this from just looking a bit historical, you see that the, uh, the, let's say, the power of this genome technology, as well as our increased knowledge on studying the intellectual disability genetics, has allowed us to diagnose now more than half of our patients with severe intellectual disability. If you just look back something like 20 years ago, we could diagnose less than, uh, than 10, 20 percent. So this is good news, and of course, this is a starting point also for further development of, of therapies. So I wanted to conclude and then just have one more brief outlook to the future. So to conclude from, from, from our work so far is that next generation sequencing technology is really allowing us to look at all the genes or even the entire genome of a patient. Uh, I think that we will all conclude that as soon as it's affordable, genome sequencing is the best technology to use for detecting and mapping uh, both de novo point mutations as well as structural genomic variations, as well, of course, as all the inherited variations that every genome uh, harbors. Um, de novo mutations in genes uh, already explain the majority of severe intellectual disability in outbred populations. Of course, in inbred populations there will be a large recessive component as well. Uh, and there is many questions that we want to study further on the role of de novo mutations, including studying the role of non-coding de novo mutations, the risk factors. One of the risk factors that we identified, and others as well, is that uh, actually an aging father is the biggest risk factor. So all, most of these mutations, about 80%, occur on the paternal allele. And older men, they give more mutations to their uh, offspring. So this is when I always tell ladies to think about their future husband. <laughs> and then finally, of course, I also want to look at other disorders which can be explained by de novo mutations. Just one slide with a look at and then I will end. Uh, I think uh, there is a whole lot to be done for genomics in the clinic in the coming uh, period. Uh, and it's great to see so many specialties here present who are interested in genetics because indeed it's important for many disorders. Uh, genome diagnostics uh, really will become a, a standard and a first tier test for, for most genetic diseases I'm sure of. Uh, there is many uh, of us also working in things like non-invasive prenatal genetic diagnostics. So that is a very important field of research. Of course, for recessive disorders, we can do carrier testing of a genome of, of, of future parents. Uh, we can develop pharmacogenomics tests to prescribe the right drug to the right person. Uh, especially in cancer genome sequencing, of course, this is important to tailor uh, the treatment. And of course, we will also move to an area whereby perhaps you and me will have our genome sequenced just to, to look at our genome and think whether we can perhaps prevent disease from occurring. The question really is how far we want to go, and that's something we have to discuss together uh, in our field, but also, of course, with society. I want to thank many, many, many people. I've uh, decided here to put many of my colleagues from Nijmegen and Maastricht who've been really fantastically uh, in my work. I cannot thank all of them uh, enough because this is work from a big team. Uh, and of course, I want to thank uh, Han Brunner, uh, my, my, my colleague who was, I've worked with with so much pleasure for so many years, uh, and I will continue to do that. And I want to thank all the patients and families involved and all collaborators around the world, as well, of course, as some of the financing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Veltman. Uh, we will leave the questions as a panel uh, at the end of the second talk. 
It gives me again a great pleasure to introduce our uh, winner uh, of the King Fasa International Prize, Professor Henry Garrett. Uh, Professor Henry is a uh, graduate uh, from uh, medicine in 1984 and then joined uh, Rapid uh, University for uh, clinical genetics where he have been employed as a, a staff member until he got his PhD uh, in 1993 and was then after that in 98 was appointed as a full professor uh, in uh, human genetics uh, uh, of the Department of Human Genetics at uh, Robot University. Uh, he's currently also the head of the Department of uh, Human Genetics uh, and at the University Center and the Department of Clinical Genetics at Maastricht University. Uh, medical center and uh, he focused again his research on uh, observations about uh, human molecular genetics uh, and intellectual uh, disability, human behavior and uh, some of the neuromuscular diseases uh, disorder. Uh, we will be honored again to uh, listen to his speech. Uh, so please Professor uh, Well, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to speak, and thank you for so many of you to, to be here. Uh, this is my first visit to Saudi Arabia. It's a, 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 a pleasure. It's also an adventure to see such a young country and so many things that are happening, and so many things are happening in genetics here. And we've heard a little bit about what happens in this center, uh, uh, which is really, really impressive. So I'm going to talk a bit from the clinical uh, point of view, uh, which Joris touched upon, he, he, he talked about the technology, but also about the applications, which is the thing we've been doing together. Uh, and uh, I think it's been a fantastically rewarding experience. And uh, so now, so far, I think we've done about 10,000 diagnostic exomes at, at Nijmegen and Maastricht together. And it's only been around for a very, very short time, as you know. It's about, been, been here for 10 years. Uh, one of the first people to actually uh, have his genome sequence was Craig Venter, who won the uh, King Faisal International Prize, I think, about 10 years ago, uh, because of his work to develop the technology. And after this, uh, people started sequencing um, uh, other people, mostly geneticists at first, uh, and then uh, celebrities. So a lot of famous people were sequenced. Uh, but then it turned out that, the, that uh, this, the genome of a famous person is actually very uninteresting. <laughs> so, uh, some, so people had to find another use for it to, what to do with this technology. Uh, and that's how we got into this. This is, uh, as you can see, this is Joris and myself and two young students. Um, Joop, who uh, did a lot of our bioinformatics with Christian, and, uh, and Lysenka, who uh, really, really is the overall coordinator of everything. She tells us what to do. Uh, so you need someone like that. You, you can have the professors who go and give talks and, uh, and have uh, you know, wild ideas all the time. You need someone on the ground to actually make it happen. And Lysenka has been very much been a, a key person in our group. So the focus we've used, and I think this is uh, what a lot of people have done around the world with this technology, is to focus on cancer, of course, but also to focus on rare diseases. And the thing about rare diseases, of course, is that there are so many of them that together they're not rare at all. So there's very good data that um, even in an outbred situation, about 6% of everyone will have a rare disease in their lifetime. And many of these are genetic. And the problem with the rare diseases is because there are so many of them that they're often not recognized or not recognizable by clinicians, even by good clinical doctors. And I'll be coming back to that point. So for that reason, they are often never diagnosed or diagnosed very late. And many, many patients first get the wrong diagnosis. And that means, again, that for these, this group of patients, they often go from one doctor to another doctor and they, they, then they suffer. They suffer because they get the wrong treatment or no treatment at all. They suffer because they get all of these procedures and investigations. Some of these will be painful. And, uh, and of course, it costs a lot of money. And this is from a survey done in England uh, some years ago, five years ago, 
And they asked this question, and this is, they asked this of patients who actually had been diagnosed. And they said, looking back, how long did it take? And about 25%, it took less than three months. In another 25%, it took less than a year. But in another 25%, it took between one and five years, and in 25%, it took more than five years, and sometimes it took up to 20 years. So someone has a disease, they are going around, they're being seen by doctors, and nobody actually understands what they have. And this is not just bad medicine, it's also very lonely. If you're, you have an unexplained um, disease that nobody understands, it is a difficult thing to live with. And this is the number of doctors these patients saw. And again, you see that it varies from one to two or three to five. But many patients saw six or seven or 10 or even 15 different doctors, often in different hospitals, before finally someone said, oh, I know. And that's the problem. That's the real problem with rare disease. So here's a, an example um, that we use a lot. And, and, and Yora showed a, a slide of one of my patients that you will see soon. Uh, this is a patient uh, seen by a, a Belgian colleague, uh, Kuhn de Vriend from Leuven, and he saw this patient many years ago, uh, and this patient has intellectual disability and also a, a special face. So if you can look at this, you can see there's a thin upper lip, and there's these arched eyebrows, and the nose is kind of short, and the eyes go down on the side. Can you see that? But... Kuhn sent me this picture. He said, when I showed this to him, I said, I've seen a patient. I was talking to Kuhn. I said, I've seen this patient. I really don't understand what he has. Uh, and this is my patient, Sibe. And Sibe, as you can see, uh, looks a little similar. So if you put them together, they really are very, very similar. But they're not related. But the mothers then went and visited so they, uh, they went and, and met each other. They only live 150 kilometers. It's two countries, but it's only 150 kilometers. And they met and they came back and they said, oh yeah, they have the same thing. What is it? They said. And I said, I have no idea. So that was, it was a bit helpful because they were now, you know, they could share experiences. We still didn't know what they had. So, so uh, Joris and Lysenka and everyone, they did the sequencing. And so the 20,000 genes were sequenced of Ender, of this first patient and his parents, and he has one de novo mutation in the gene called PACS1. And that's good, because it, but it didn't really help because we never heard of PACS1. It's a gene we don't understand. But then, of course, we could sequence Seba's DNA as well, and he has two de novo mutations, and one is in the same gene. So that didn't look like a coincidence because there's 20,000 genes. And then if we compare the mutation, it was actually the same identical DNA change. It was the same nucleotide out of 6 billion. So we said, that's not, you know, that has to be real. That has to be the thing. So it was through linking these two patients together and then comparing their DNA that the discovery was made. So... Uh, We've since found 16 more patients worldwide. And many of those were found because we published this, and in other labs they found this, uh, something in the same gene, and they contacted us. They said, oh, we think we have the same thing. So that sort of brought the patients together. But that was not the most effective thing that happened. The most effective, and I think this is an important lesson we're learning, was not the doctors finding each other. It was the mothers who put this on Facebook. And they found other mothers. And the mothers came and said, or the grandmothers sometimes, you know, the fathers are interested, but they don't do this. That's the mothers who do this. So they came and said to us, you know, we found another patient, you know, in, one in Hong Kong and one in China and so on. So that's what I think is happening. So a real driver of this, to, for rare patients, they will find each other and they will share experiences. And they will be part of this new effort to understand disease. And they're very important. So the first conclusion, you know, five years ago, was that these de novo mutations, they, they can cause this severe intellectual disability. And we can find them very effectively by trio exome sequencing. The point, of course, being that you do not just sequence the patient. You also sequence the father and the mother. And that gives you the information genetically. Why is this important? 
Well, it's important to CBIS parents and other parents because it is the end of a journey. They, they, there is no longer a need to go to other doctors and ask what happened. Now you know. And that's good because most parents, certainly most mothers of children with intellectual disability feel guilty because they think it was something they did. And it's not every mother, but most mothers feel like this. And you can now say, you know, it was not something you did. It was a mutation. It just happened. And it was nobody's fault. And that's important. You can tell people that the recurrence risk, the risk that this will happen again in the next pregnancy, is very low. Because it's around 1%. And it's not like in a recessive disease, it's not 25%. Which, of course, changes the perspective. In this case, um, we were too late. Because by the time we found this, it was, Siba was 10 years old, his mother was 40, and they decided you know, they'd never had another baby because they were so worried they would have two or three with the same thing. So they just had him. And when we came, uh, it was too late. She said, they said, you know, we're not, we have adapted our family life to this situation. We're not going to have this again. They said, why it took you so long, the mother said. And we said, you know, we're very sorry we had to wait for the technology to make this possible. And then there's hope. And the hope is that this somehow, this information, will be useful. And I get this question a lot. I get this question in the Netherlands from the health insurance companies who say, you are spending money on these tests. Are you going to cure SIBA? And I say, no. And then they say, so why would we pay for this? And I say, well, you know, it's really important to the family and it's important to them. And they say, no, 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 it's not that. You need to show that this is medically relevant. Well, actually, it was. Because, you see, Sibe, when he was a baby, when he was just born, he had a complication, a bowel problem, which led to a volvulus, which led to necrosis, and he had to have a really big operation, and he lost most of his gut. And now, at 10, he's very small, and he doesn't grow very well. So he's being evaluated in another university by a specialist gastroenterologist who looks at his feeding because he's got a problem with digestion. So the gastroenterologist called me and he said, do you know whether the short stature and the problem with the growth is a part of his syndrome? Because if it's part of his syndrome, I'm not going to do anything because I can't change that. But if it's not part of his syndrome, then it probably is to do with his gut problem, and I need to fix it. And I said, well, you know, I know one more patient in the world. One. That was the other one that I showed you. And I said, he never had the bowel problem, and he grows normally. He is of normal size. So that was helpful, because we now knew, the gastro I could now tell the gastroenterologist and say, this is not part of the syndrome. It is, therefore, it is likely a part of, your, of his gut problem, and it would, might, ha, uh, might be very useful for him to be evaluated and investigated for his, his bowel problems. And he was, and it was helpful. So even just knowing one more patient in the world can change the medical um, procedures. So this is why rare diseases matter. Uh, first of all, the parents really, really, and the patients, uh, in other cases, really want to know. I believe, I believe, personally believe, that we do not have to do gene therapy all the time for these rare diseases. We can improve uh, uh, diseases a lot by just standard medical treatment if we understand the disease. And that's why the diagnosis is so important. Even a very small number of patients can inform care. And I personally believe, and a lot of people in Europe feel like this, that every patient with a rare disease should have a doctor who actually knows that disease. And that means you have to centralize a little bit. You have to have centers of expertise. And we're setting these up in Europe at this time. So this has really, really taken off. And we're doing a lot of these tests. I know you're doing a lot of testing here uh, using panels. And we've done a lot of testing using exomes. Uh, we do them for about 2,000 US dollars, which is a lot of money, but it's not prohibitive. We can spend that money. Uh, the second point uh, that I'll be making in a moment, and I can say this because I'm a medical doctor and I have 30 years of experience, but sadly, we medical doctors are not as good. We're not perfect. 
we do not diagnose everything. We're not, we do not have, not have this magical ability to see a patient and say, hey, that disease. It happens sometimes and it makes us happy, but it doesn't happen enough. And therefore, um, we need uh, a technology to help us. And we can handle this, uh, this diagnostic strategy. So uh, this has really increased from 1,000, 1,500 uh, tests in 2013, 4,000 in 2014, uh, 6,000 in 2015, and this year we'll probably be doing 8,000 8, diagnostic exomes uh, in our clinic as a tool for diagnosis and differential diagnosis, and it's across a range of difficult, different problems, not just intellectual disability. It's basically anything uh, that is uh, not understood, any problem patients. The cost is about $2,000 or euros, if you will, uh, but if we look back on the, uh, the numbers of tests other tests that are being run on these patients, actually you spend as much pay, uh, money doing the wrong tests than if you just did the genome sequencing or the exome sequencing. So in the end, you're even, if you just look at the testing procedures, you might be saving some money. And we have some, some research, Yoris has some research to show that that is actually true. Uh, and this is happening here as well. We just heard this morning, uh, as we do more exome sequencing, we do a less of the other testing, and that also means that we do, we're not just spending money, we're also saving money at the same time. So it's a very economical change. One important um, component of this is informed consent. And five years ago when we started, uh, 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 th there were very intense debates on, you know, is this not problematic because you, maybe you know too much. And if you know a lot about your genome, maybe there will be things that you didn't want to know. So how are you going to do this? And the, the solution we came up with, and other groups as well, is to just ask the patient. So we have informed consent. We have a form like this, which basically says, do you want the test? Do you understand that we will try to solve the problem you have, but that we might theoretically find something else. And for this reason, we have the test comes in two flavors. Either we test only the genes we know are important for the, your problem. So if you have a heart disease, we'll only test for the heart genes. We'll, t we'll, we'll actually sequence everything. The information is on the disk or on the, on the stick, if you will, or on the computer. But you ask the bioinformaticians to just extract the relevant information, just the heart genes. Or you can choose and say, well, I'm desperate. I want to know absolutely everything. Give me all the genes. But then, of course, you take the risk that we find something else, something we were not looking for, something genetic that is in your genes. And what we find is this. If we ask, give people the choice, then most patients and families who have very severe and progressive disease they say, give me the complete test. I don't care what else you're going to find. Or maybe they will say, I think it's actually good to know everything. Uh, and this happens in situ for instance, this happens in, in people with cancer. And we explain that, you know, we might find something else. And they say, you know what, doctor, I've had cancer. You know, I've had the worst disease. I don't, you know, I just want the information. But people who have more, more, more stable disease or, late, or uh, more uh, and less severe disease, they will often choose a panel a, a, a analysis of the data. So they will have a targeted analysis. And this happens in things, in things like deafness in an adult person uh, who's, had, who's been deaf for all of his life. And they may just say, you know, just give me that little bit of information. I don't want the rest of it. We've been using this for a wide range of problems. And uh, the interesting thing is that it works in a very, very wide range of problems. Kidney disease, heart disease, cancer, neurological disease, immune deficiencies especially. So the, 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 the success rate is anywhere from 10 to 50 percent, which for mo because these are hard cases. These are very difficult patients. That is a very good number. And the truth we found is that the hit rate, so the diagnostic rate of exome sequencing, actually is higher than what uh, uh, even the best doctors can achieve 
by examining their patients. Now we've shown this formally in a retrospective study. If you compare the, the blue and the green bars, the blue was the year 2010, I think, or t when, we, uh, when we were still, uh, we, only, we didn't have exome sequencing, so we, we allowed doctors to choose a test and they got a certain percentage was diagnosed. And then the next year we ha had exome sequencing and for these same groups of patients, we got two to three times more diagnoses, showing that you need th this technology is, ne is a necessary complement to what a doctor can do. And this partly explains why we get so many requests these days. So as yours was saying, for intellectual disability, which has been one of our main focuses, uh, most patients now have a diagnosis. When, when I started 30 years ago, it was very rare for us to diagnose anything. And in non-consanguinous populations, most severe intellectual disability then is caused. The diagnostic yield is 10 to 50 percent and is across a range of disease categories. And we're, we're, this is why medical genetics is now moving sort of center stage in the, in the hospital. We work with neurology, we work with internal medicine, we work with every specialty in the clinic. Uh, whereas, um, uh, you know, many years ago we were in the basement and nobody could find us. Now I think medical genetics is becoming integrated and you've heard about personalized medicine. So this de novo paradigm is important. Uh, we find uh, some interesting examples of that. There, there is one gene on the X chromosome, which we find, uh, where we find these de novo mutations in intellectual disability, and it's only in women. It's only in females. Uh, and this is a new gene. There's another gene, you may, some of you may know, that was mentioned, the RET syndrome gene. This is another syndrome that was new, that we just discovered, and it only affects females. What we think is happening that if these mutations hit the X chromosome in a male, then that is lethal. So these boys are never born. But the girls, of course, they have two X chromosomes that are a lot stronger, so they are born, but then they have this intellectual disability. Uh, okay, we've seen that. Now, this is a little puzzling, I think. And, of course, here in Saudi Arabia and a lot of other countries around, there's consanguinity, and you see a lot of recessive intellectual disability. This is a study by my predecessor at Nijmegen and my mentor, Hilger Ropers, who's on the slide. Uh, and he studied uh, um, consanguinous families in Iran, and he found a lot of genes a lot of genes for intellectual disability. And we don't see them. And I think uh, the, the explanation is that most of the time, mutations are lost, and they're lost fairly quickly. And that means that unless the, two, the mutation finds itself by a consanguinity loop, for instance, in a cousin marriage, it will be lost. It will be lost and you'll never see it. And it will be lost from the population before it has caused the problem. So therefore, um, these recessive mutations are not a big problem in outbred populations, but they are in consanguineous populations. Now, uh, we, again, we've heard this morning that you are thinking about programs for premarital screening, trying to reduce the burden of these diseases. And if, if that happens, of course, uh, that would be fantastic because there would be so many uh, fewer uh, sick and handicapped people. But you will still have the de novo mutations. These you cannot remove. They are part of, a nature, of nature and they, are, they will keep happening all the time. So you cannot, we think at this stage, you cannot go below half a percent or so of all people born with severe handicap. Even if we have the best prenatal care, even if with the best genetic you know, testing, if we do everything optimally, we will still have half a percent of the newborns with severe handicaps. That part of it cannot be um, removed. Consanguinity, roughly, there's, there's a good study from uh, uh, Britain on Pakistani, uh, roughly doubles the incidence of rare disease, and uh, especially in a consanguineous situation, I think more than 60% of severe intellectual disability will, will be genetic. Another thing we learned, which is uh, uh, not on this slide, is that 
we, we like, in medicine, we like to put diagnostic labels on. So, intellectual disability or autism. I notice when we just entered, there's an autism research center here. Or what neurologists call epileptic encephalopathy. And one of the big surprises has been that a lot of the time, the genes for these different, what we think clinically are different diseases, sometimes the genes are the same. So for some reason, biology will not follow our categories. Doctors say, this is how it, things are, and then the biology says, well, no. So I think we're learning a lot about that the, the, the distinctions we've been making between diseases actually are not entirely correct and we need to modify them and improve. And that, of course, will be very helpful for, for personalized medicine. All right, finally, because of what I just said, uh, I think even though we're doing a lot of testing uh, uh, at Nijmegen and in other uh, places like in the US or England um, uh, or Canada, uh, we're not going to be very good at finding these recessive genes. The optimal scientific strategy is to look at a consanguineous population. So the ones we found, some of the ones like this, this is Robinow syndrome, which is a, a dwarfing syndrome. We found the gene for this, and we worked with colleagues and friends in Turkey. Uh, and they had a lot of recessive and consanguineous families with this. And that allowed us to find the gene. And uh, this is GAPO syndrome. Uh, and here there's four patients, one is from Sri Lanka, and the other three are from Egypt, working with Samia Temtemi at Cairo. And again, that is what uh, allowed us to find that gene. And I know you found a lot of genes here already. So it does need uh, research in consanguineous populations. So I am on the ERDRG uh, Diagnostic Committee. This is the International Rare Diseases Research Consortium. It's a conglomerate of uh, many, many uh, countries and, uh, and institutions. And the, one of the goals is that all the new genes, uh, all the genes for rare diseases should be discovered. Uh, and I think that will happen. But uh, it needs a complement. It needs studies in outbreak populations like we are doing, and we'll find a lot of the, the dominant uh, uh, genes but we know, we're not going to be very good at finding the recessive genes, and it really, really has to be done here. And so I think it's really good that you have become very active here. And I found this, and I've, been, I've heard about this a little this morning, about the Saudi Human Genome Pro Program, where you all work together. That is a miracle, by the way. We try to work together in the Netherlands, which is a smaller country, and we find this difficult. In my country, we have egos, uh, I'm sure that doesn't happen here because you have the, the genome pro program and you all work together. But I think to do that is really, really important and is really helpful. And I think you will, you will make an impact. And I was very pleased to see that the Saudi Human Genome pro Program is a part of, of ERDRG. So you are connected to this uh, worldwide effort. Okay, finally, rare diseases are important because there are so many of them. They're individually so rare, there's at least 8,000 of them. They occur in at least 6% of the population over their lifetime. They are even more important in consanguineous populations. And we can efficiently diagnose them by next generation sequencing. Next generation sequencing drives this high diagnostic yield, and it's higher than what even the best doctors can do, uh, let alone uh, average doctors like myself. Uh, and many recessive genes, especially I think many recessive genes, have not been discovered, and there's a lot to do, uh, and they can only be found in consanguineous populations. So I have tried uh, also to put um, people on this slide, and we should have 20 slides. We work with so many people. If you work in the rare disease field, you need to find friends and colleagues because every patient is unique. Uh, a lot of people at Nijmegen. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for this opportunity sp to speak to here, and we'll be very glad to take questions. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Henry. And uh, we have five to ten minutes for uh, some questions. I can guide this uh, before the uh, lunch. And I would like to. Uh, I start by uh, you know asking 
you know, we are running with King Faisal Specialist Hospital a genetic counseling master, uh, master program. And uh, I think, you know, these discoveries gonna change the face of genetic counseling uh, in that perspective. So, you know, what do you think of, of, of that, uh, you know, the future of genetic counseling with now the new discovery of so many anomalies uh, in genomics uh, analysis? Yes, um, um, I, think, I think that is commendable. And I think it's really important that you've, you've decided to establish this program in genetic counseling. Genetic information is useless unless it is transmitted by, uh, by someone who is skilled in communication. One thing we tend to do as doctors, we give a lot of technical information to our patients and the patient have, when they leave the office, they have no idea what the doctor said. And I think genetic counselors do this a lot better. So, um, so I think that is essential. And I think, again, doctors in other specialties, they don't have the time to sit down and talk about these difficult issues like family planning and so on with their patients. So that is why uh, I think to have Genetic, a genetic counseling program here, I think, is a fantastic idea. All right. Any questions from the audience? Yes, here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this uh, great uh, presentation. I have uh, two questions, one technical, one clinical. Uh, how do you compare the different uh, NGS uh, platforms that is available? Uh, and what's your experience with the, those different platforms, if you have? And the other question, uh, clinical, how you, how you deal with the, the incidental finding of whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, and what's your experience from a family uh, I mean, reaction to that re results? Okay. Shall, shall I ask the question, answer the question on the, the platforms? So, of course, we've been uh, doing next generation sequencing since uh, about 2008, so we have used and worked with many different uh, platforms. It's clear that at this moment there is uh, one comp company dominating the market, which is Illumina. Uh, they have very good sequencing technology, so we like it very much. And we use it uh, for our exome sequencing uh, through the company BGI at this moment. We also use, let's say, the short, the smaller sequencing uh, uh, equipment that they provide, like the NexSeq uh, for, for targeted panels. Um, we've also worked with, uh, a lot with the company Complete Genomics, which is now taking over by BGI for, for whole genome sequencing. Uh, we like that technology very much as well, and uh, we're also still working with BGI on, on looking at different platforms. So there is many different platforms, and they have many differences. Um, at the same time, uh, what we all also experience is that even with the same platform, you can have, let's say, by using different bioinformatics, you can have differences. So I think there is not one one choice. Um, uh, perhaps you're also asking a little bit about, let's say, the difference between going for a targeted panel versus exome or genome sequencing. Um, and I think that is very much, uh, let's say, dependent on the disorder. Uh, and it's also dependent a little bit on, on, on budgets and how you organize things. So we do targeted uh, panels for disorders which, which have, let's say, whether it's a limited number of genes where you can get a high diagnostic yields. But we have chosen also strategically to move more to the exome sequencing for most other disorders. Um, and, and I think that's, that's that we would like to keep on doing in the coming period. And we, we hope to move to genome sequencing in the coming few years. <coughs> Is that an answer to that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and the best technology platform, I think, is in the future. <laughs> Always. So it's not there yet. We, we're, we're all waiting for the, the best thing to happen. Um, but maybe, maybe the technology, I, I know you've, uh, you have technology here, maybe the technology, the sequencing technology, I don't think is the, is the biggest factor. It is the things you said, like genetic counseling, it is the bioinformatics. Those are the parts that, that if, as Joris said, if we work on those parts, uh, that's where the, the, the greatest advances are made at this time. Isn't it, isn't it, isn't it the finding? Incidental findings, yes. Yes, we have incidental findings. Because I said we do whole exomes and we give people the opportunity to have the complete package. So we say what happens, so we, uh, so it's, I thank you for asking this. So um, 
What it also says on our consent form, which we explain, is that if we have something in a, another gene, and I always say, you know, this could be a cancer gene, or it could be a gene for sudden cardiac death, so severe conditions. If we find that, what happens? So we take it, we have established an independent panel, an expert panel, and they will look at this result. And they will look at this result on behalf of the family. So the family doesn't know this, because if they knew this, they knew something was going on, so you can't do that. So they look at this and say, is this information medically relevant? And if it is relevant, they will advise us to go back to the family and tell them. So this happens. We do, we did, I said we did about 6,000 tests last year. And the incidental findings using our bioinformatics protocols happen in about one or two percent. So that's up to a hundred. So that's not, you know, that's not, it's not enormous, but it's a significant number of people. So what happens? Well, two things happen. First of all, people are shocked that you found this. Well, some of them are not shocked. Some of them say, oh, I know, this is in my family. And now I understand why it's in my family. So some people just go, yeah. But a lot of people really are shocked. Uh, uh, and and they, they, they need time. And you need to talk to them. And you need to talk to them multiple times. At the end, which is usually after a few weeks, and we then see them again after a few months. So you need to sort of keep give them continuous care. Most of them, the large majority say, I can deal, I can handle this information, I understand it and I, I know what to do about it. And many of them say, I'm now happy you found this because you told me in time so that I can take preventive measures. I can perhaps prevent the complications from happening. So for them, it, so what it does to many people is it gives them a sense of control about their lives. So it's a very mixed message. But we've not had, we didn't, ha we have had a lot of drama, but we've not had calamities. We've not had very bad things happening. So it is, it's a bad news situation but as you know, in other parts of medicine, if you give people bad news, they handle it. They deal with it. Uh, so at the end of it, I think um, it is not something that, is, that um, is preventing us from using that technology. And this comes back to a debate I was chairing five years ago in Montreal. There was the International Congress, the World Congress of Human Genetics. And there was a debate, there were about 4,000 people in the room. It was in America, or sorry, it was in Canada, in Montreal. And about one third of the audience, and they, there were microphones, and one third of the audience said, you, you should not do this. You will just create panic and, 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 and depression, and people will feel very bad about it. And, and two thirds of the audience said, you know, we should trust people, you know, they live their lives, they have other bad news. People can handle this. And I think, generally speaking, we found, and other people find, people find that people are strong and they can handle this information, but they should be given the choice. You should give them the choice to either have the, the, the big test and take this risk of that information, or not have this big test, and this needs very careful counseling. Yes, great. I have a simple question. What do you think is the role of CASPER, CAS9 technology in terms of gene editing as future prospects for diagnosis and treatment? So simple questions never have simple answers. Here's the expert. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is always nice when you get a question like this. No, so I think it's, uh, of course, this technology is, is tremendously important uh, and, and it's only just happening. Yeah? So, so we don't know the impact of this technology on, on gene therapy as a whole. Um, I think it's important, uh, yes, it's more or less it's a combination, so it's, we need the genome sequencing for diagnosing the patient and then we need to see where, where, where we can do something. 
Now the problem of course is that many of these disorders, uh, like for example intellectual disability, where the mutation is already, let's say, having an effect uh, during the, the development of the child, it will be very difficult to treat even with the, with the, the new technologies like the CRISPR-Cas. Uh, CRISPR uh, so I'm not, I'm not immediately sure we will you know, immediately benefit for all these rare disorders, but especially disorders which occur a little bit later, or develop a little bit later, perhaps some, some of things like blindness, where it, it develops during, uh, uh, let's say, during the, the, in the, coming, in the years. Uh, there, the, these kind of technologies will have an impact, and of course the, the idea that you can specifically target uh, genes and, and correct mutations is, is, is fascinating. Um, we are both not experts on, on, on the therapy field, but we are investing in these kind of technologies, and we have colleagues working on this. I think it has enormous uh, potential in terms of the HIV detection, treatment, and also in cancer th therapy yeah, as sure, well. Sure, sure. No, I, I, I think I agree. Yes. Yes, we can take final question. Uh, two questions, yes. <laughs> we start. Uh, oh. yeah. um, uh, just a, a couple of things, I think, uh, with respect to rare diseases. Uh, one of the perspectives uh, from here, I remember when I first uh, joined uh, the Institute, we were contacted by colleagues about uh, a, a rare disease in the dental clinic, and it was claimed that there were some 20 to 30 cases worldwide. And I walked down to the dental clinic, and I found a, a Swedish uh, dentist who said, I have 200 cases in my clinic. So, uh, you know, we, we have an environment here where I think some things are, are a little, little bit different. And I want to sort of congratulate you and thank you for uh, introducing this transformational technology into uh, both research and the clinic in genetics. But I would also ask that uh, uh, where you uh, almost always see multiple affected individuals in a family, you're not looking at one affected individual, but often uh, cases where you may even see more, more than five affected individuals in a family, uh, does that lend uh, thinking uh, towards a stratified approach using these technologies rather than uh, going uh, at full speed you know, towards whole genome, which is practical, but because it's practical, should we use it, particularly in these scenarios? Yeah, no, so I, I, I think it's, it's absolutely true that, that, let's say, the diagnosis can be very different in, in, in countries uh, like here, where you have multiple affected. Um, I mean, I think in general, just, just an answer, in general, when people ask to me, like, uh, targeted versus, for example, exome, or do first targeted sequencing and then do exome sequencing, I think, yes, there is, there is a possibility for this, and definitely in, in this period still is also economically perhaps more feasible to do the targeted sequencing. Um, on the other hand, if you look, let's say, five years ahead, uh, we see already that we can do now exome sequencing for a few hundred euros, and I expect that we can do genomes for a few hundred euros in a few years. And then I think this discussion on doing, let's say, targeted first before you do a genome, I think it's, it's more a discussion on, on, let's say, the ethical discussions, what do we want, the, the incidental findings, uh, then it's, it's an economical, let's say, discussion and then say how to stratify. So in that way, we've, we've We've said we will move forward to the exome and the genome because we think that is where our field is moving. It's more expensive at this moment, but actually it will, it will help us to make this transition. And that's also perhaps our role in the field to try these new technologies. Uh, but of course, many laboratories around the world currently are using these targeted panels. And I think uh, especially also, for, like you say, this is very important. Thank you. Yeah, I, would, I would also very quickly, yeah. very briefly yeah. answer that question. I think Using the family information, I think, is, is, is fantastically efficient and, and crucial, and you should do that. As Joris was talking, I was thinking, perhaps here, the same thing is happening that's happening in Europe, and that, that families are becoming smaller. Maybe previously you would have families of seven or eight siblings. Maybe that number is now no longer always seven or eight. Maybe the average number of children per family is going down. If that happens here, no. then by necessity, Not happening, no. more often you will have a single <laughs> affected person. No. Is it happening? No, uh, the average family in Saudi Arabia is 6.3. And it's not going down. And it's not going down. But in I that think case, it, my remark was completely... No, but I think also <laughs> the question doesn't stop at a family size because uh, there is a tribal size. That too, yeah. So, and these tribals will be in hundreds of thousands where some of them will only marry from the same tribe. So, and this goes uh, descendant very, you know, what we call pure tribe for 
again hundreds of years. So uh, we can take the final question before we uh, close. Uh, thank you very much. Just a very brief question. One of the issues that you mentioned and has been surrounding this uh, whole area was the ethical aspect of it. Um, and one of the concerns has been that it, since all of this information is now available, this information possibly falling into the wrong hands, insurance companies denying patients uh, insurance. So I was just wondering how you guys were dealing with these kind of sensitive information, the storage and the uh, ethical dimensions um, of having this vast amount of information available um, yeah. uh, to people. So. That, that's a fantastic question. I'll take an hour and uh, <laughs> discuss it from every <laughs> angle. Uh, so so it is, it's a really important question. So, uh, you, but you specifically mentioned information falling into the wrong hands. So I think there's, so that immediately suggests two things. One is, it, this should, should be stored in a secure place. And <coughs> the genomic information should not be linked directly to, to personal information or patient information. Uh, so uh, in the lab, actually, everything just has a number. And there are no names, and there are no pedigrees with names on. So we've, we keep everything separated from the start. That's one. The second thing you need to have, and we have this in the Netherlands, is you need a good law. That makes it completely illegal <coughs> for people to misuse this information. And also, for we have a law that says the insurance companies cannot have this information within certain limits. So I think to have a good law is very, very important. Yeah. And then finally, unfortunately, if you take this class to the lab here, you have my genome. We have and everything. I have to accept this fact because I'm going to leave this class here and you may have my genome. So I think that dimension, that perspective is there as well. I don't think ultimately we cannot keep our genomic information secret in every respect. And therefore, that enforces this idea that we need to discuss it. We need to have an ethical debate. But we also need very, very, very clear uh, legal restrictions on this. Yes. Uh, and then thank you very much for uh, both speakers for this intellectual uh, talks and enlightening. Thank you all the uh, attendees from both King Faisal Specialist Hospital, the Research Center and uh, Al Faisal University. Uh, I would like to welcome you again at Riyadh and wish you a happy ceremonial uh, evening uh, winning the prizes and thank you again for all your efforts. I was asking if Dr. Joris would like to touch the glass also. Yes. <laughs> That's it. We got both guys. Thank you, my <laughs>